Thanks for having me on the call today is uh, my sidekick, Matt DeYoung. Matt, how you doing? Can you hear me? Hey, Eddie. Hey, thanks for every, everyone for having us here today. So go ahead and take and, it away, uh, Matt, to get us started. Yeah, sure. So we're so glad to be in the room today, and Raleigh and everyone at Trading Pub, Yana, been uh, so courteous and hospitable to us. And, and we're going to go through a number of things today, and I want to outline what those are so you'll be sure to know what to expect. And um, three or four things we want to cover. First of all, we talked just briefly about Windows XP. Raleigh mentioned that. We want to give a heads up to everybody in the trading community about this, and Eddie will explain that in, in detail, but not spending too much time because we want to move on to talking about uh, avoiding the biggest trading computer misconception and what exactly that is. Eddie will explain. And then um, how to know really and have a live demonstration as to whether your computer that you're using now or if you have a dedicated machine uh, just for trading, if that's really up to par and what is that par or, in, or as we call it, the, the benchmark. We'll get into that today. And then we will give you a minimum checklist for trading so that you walk away with some materials in your hand. And on that note, we do have a, a comprehensive version of what we're talking about today that Eddie, maybe you want to explain. Yeah, so we do have a, a buyer's guide. It's called uh, the Complete Guide to Trading Computers. And uh, Matt, if you could just put a link in the in the chat. Everything we talk about today during this webinar is in that buyer's guide and more. So if you click on the link and you put your email address in, it'll send you the buyer's guide immediately. So you'll you'll have mm -hmm. it when the webinar is over. You can take a look at it. And the reason we do mention that is we, we always try to cram as much as we can into these webinars, but as you can probably guess, there are a lot of questions about trading uh, computers, about computer technology. Uh, we all wish we had somebody in our backyard to ask questions to, but uh, we, we don't always. So that's what this webinar is for, and oftentimes there's more questions than we can get to. But I do encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. I will um, watch for them, and we'll have some time at the end. So Eddie, I think uh, Raleigh gave you a wonderful introduction and we want to talk a little bit about uh, your background and why you're qualified to be here today before we get into the demonstration. And I would just ask you how you got started with computers. That's a great question. I'm, I'd like to put you in my time machine and take you back to 1980. I was 11 years old and a good friend of mine got an Apple II. That was like the hot name of the, at the time. Um, Apple and Tandy, those were the big names. And uh, he brings me over to his house and he shows me his computer. And one of the things he shows me, like when I get there, is he's got, he's got like the black screen with the green letters, if you remember those. And there were words scrolling across, across the screen um, quite a bit. There was a lot of, of, um, of scrolling of words. I'm like, what, what's going on? What, what's it doing? And what he had done is he had plugged his computer into his telephone with this funky looking device and people were calling into his computer one by one and leaving messages on his computer. What he had done is set up something called an electronic bulletin board. Today we would call that a website, except back then people would call in one at a time. Uh, so I just thought this was the coolest thing in the world. People were posting messages about comic books. It was a, specifically related to uh, comic books. It was called the Bat Cave. And I just thought this was the coolest thing in the world. I was very young. Uh, so I went home that evening from my friend's house and I started a campaign uh, to my parents to get me a computer for the holidays. But unfortunately, what showed up under the tree was not what I expected. If you guys have ever seen this computer before, this thing was called the Commodore VIC-20, and uh, it was not an Apple II. It did not easily connect to the telephone. It did not run an electronic Bolton board. In fact, it had a cassette drive. That was the hard drive, and it took 45 minutes to load a program if it loaded at all. So I was very disappointed in this machine. I couldn't really get it to do anything special, and when I, my folks went to bed that night, I first got it, I pried it open with a screwdriver and started taking it apart to try to figure out how to make it stronger 
and faster and better. And that's really where the lifelong passion for, for making computers faster really came from. I've been building computers ever since, Matt. Right, so um, that's pretty interesting. And there's another side to this story, which Raleigh also mentioned at the top of the call here, um, which is that you have some, some trading experience. And I would just ask you today how you got started on Wall Street. So when it comes to Wall Street, uh, I was pretty lucky. My father was a commodities futures trader on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange. And ever since I can remember, I'm now I'm going to bring you back to the early 70s, uh, my father would take me to work with him on days I had off from school. And I loved going. I begged him to go, to, I begged to go with him because the place was a madhouse. Men behaving badly. Uh, rules of the regular world didn't apply there. So it was really a fun place to be. The energy was amazing. Uh, as I got older, when I became a teenager, I started asking a lot of questions. What is going on down here? How does this all work? My father taught me how to draw uh, point and figure charts using a pencil and graph paper. And I became incredibly interested in charting and the markets. And the day after I graduated high school, I started on that floor uh, as a clerk. And all through college, all through all the spring breaks and, and Christmas breaks and summer breaks, I worked on that floor all the way through graduate school until uh, when I finished graduate school, buddy I had at the time said, you got to come down to my firm and start with the stock market. And I knew I was going into the markets anyway. The stock market looked like a good place to be in the early 90s. So I started on Wall Street as a stockbroker. Uh, I was licensed for 17 years. It was a very interesting time to be a broker in the 90s and uh, until I transitioned uh, primarily to trading my own money. So I, I went through the, the big boom and the big bust and multiple busts and booms. So I've been there, done that on the trading end. So that's pretty interesting. And, and I just mentioned that so that people know you, you can talk the computer talk, but you can also talk the trader talk. And it seems like a simple thing, but it's very important. And, and next, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how you've um, gotten started building trading computers. Yeah, so the very first trading computer that I built was, it's a, it's a funny story because I, I got my license, my Series 7 license, early 90s. Uh, I started this little firm. Back then they had a boardroom, big boardroom um, with guys in cubicles. And there was one computer for every two guys in the boardroom. And the guy they put me next to on my, my first day, he had been there for several years. And they weren't quite these old screens the, the, with the black and the green anymore. We had, we had the black background with some colored letters now we had worked our way up to. But um, we were sharing a machine, and he essentially took over like 90% of the screen. He, he had been there three years. He allocated me like four little slots to put four symbols, and I wasn't having that. I was very uncomfortable with that. I went into the branch manager, and I essentially told him I could do surgery on this machine, add another monitor, and we could see more symbols. So that was the first trading computer that I actually built. And uh, over the years, as my career grew, um, I was always trying to make these computers more powerful, more be able to display more symbols and more charts at the same time. I was the guy in the 90s with multiple CRTs, remember these old things, on my desk. and. All through the years uh, that, I was a, that I was a broker, there was other brokers in the office would see my setup. They were always asking me to build these machines for them. So I did. And uh, so I was always building multiple machines. My father retired from the floor, and his peers were all retiring. I built trading computers for those guys. And so that kept me pretty busy between trading and, and building computers. And really wasn't until about 2009 when somebody pointed me to a Google search of the term trading computers. And I, I looked it up, and I saw there was a few companies selling computers. And it really struck me. It really, it really bothered me uh, what I saw. I felt like there, there were companies out there taking advantage of us traders, taking advantage of traders, putting a lot of information out there that was just kind of baffling, um, confusing to traders. 
and taking advantage of traders' lack of knowledge. So I've made it my mission to educate traders on computers um, so they get it from, from a straight trader point of view, not from a technical point of view. I mean, I get it. I like to drive my car fast. Uh, I'm a, I, ha I happen to have a pretty heavy right foot on the accelerator. But I, I don't really, I know, a, I know in my mind what's going on under the hood, but I'm not going to get in there and take it apart. And if you like to drive your car fast, you probably, most likely, most people like to drive fast and like to drive, don't know so much about what's going on under the hood. And the same is true with a computer. So uh, that's how the whole uh, concept started of easy trading computers, Matt. Well, Eddie, my neighbor at 6 a.m. the other morning started taking apart his uh, his car, and it's still apart, and it's not going anywhere. So <laughs> better left to the experts. But I want to get into the demo because today is about education. You mentioned that's our mission. Um, before we do, though, Eddie, uh, just talk briefly about this Windows XP issue that came up er earlier this year. Okay, so uh, back in April, Microsoft stopped supporting Windows XP. Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, they're not going to do tech support for Windows XP. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. I don't really need tech support. I I've been using it for 14 years, and I totally get it. But the big thing is that they're not going to put out security patches anymore for Windows XP. Now, I know a lot of us don't take Microsoft so seriously anymore. Uh, number one, because of the big Y2K nonsense that happened. Number two, when Microsoft Vista came out, was a disaster. And then just recently with Windows 8, it has pretty much been, a, that's like their third strike, as far as I'm concerned. Um, that being said, the Windows XP warning really is a big deal. And let me explain why. All of these operating systems are written in the same uh, computer architecture. They all are written very similarly in terms of the coding. And when new updates come out for the operating systems that they are still supporting, hackers can take these updates and reverse engineer the, the security flaw, the weakness, and then apply it to Windows XP because Microsoft's not putting patches out for XP anymore. And what that does is make, as time goes on, is going to make Windows XP more and more vulnerable to malware and to viruses. And what these guys are trying to do is steal your identity. They're trying to get your credit card information, your personal information. Um, there's a big problem with ransom, something called ransomware right now, where uh, this embedded software takes over your computer and, and essentially locks it up with a single screen that comes up asking you to put in your credit card number to unlock the computer. And it's still a big deal. It's been going on for a few years, and we're going to see more and more of this um, with people who do not update to a, a higher operating system. So Windows XP, as time goes on, is going to become more and more vulnerable. So do give that some thought. We know that like 30% of visitors to our site still are using Windows XP. So it is a big deal. Yeah, and we just mentioned that briefly, just uh, more to bring it to the trading community because uh, we do know a lot of people that still are on XP. It's, it's a real issue. But um, the other question people might have besides XP is really why are trading computers specifically needed? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, and it boils down to the biggest misconception that traders have about their computer. And that misconception is not realizing the sheer quantity of information that's pouring into their machine, the waterfall of information that's pouring into their machine that their computer has to take all this information, process it into your, uh, your prices, into your charts, into your indicators, and it has to do it in real time. There's so much information come in, coming in, and it's got to process that information in real time. Now think about when you go to Netflix on your TV or, or on your computer, and you go to pull down a movie, start a movie, what happens? 
usually get this screen, right? This little loading screen. It uh, can be a little bit different, but you guys know what I'm talking about. There's a little lag between when you actually click to start and when the movie starts playing. Now what's happening is your computer is, all, is also taking in a giant stream of data, a real-time stream of data, and turning that into a high-definition image for you to view. But what it does is it takes in a lot of this information and then starts to work on processing it into that image. And it takes, a, it takes its time to do that so it can continuously show you this HD image. But in trading, we don't have time for this, this buffering. It's called buffering. We don't have time for that. That, that data has to come in, and your computer needs to turn that into real-time real -time charts, graphs, and indicators instantly. Zero lag, zero latency. Let me give you another example. Uh, have you ever been to a sports bar? And the same game is playing on all the TVs. Maybe it's a big basketball game or the Super Bowl or just football Sunday. Um, and there's, there's TVs all over the place. Most of the TVs these days are still are HD. But a lot of these bars still have some old analog TVs laying around, and they still will use them. Um, have you ever been to a sports bar, seen the same game playing on all these TVs, except that the HD TV and the analog TV, there's like a second and a half between each game. It's the same game, but the one is delayed a little bit. Have you ever seen that? Here's a picture I found on, on Google, and it's an example of what I'm talking about. This is the same game on both these TVs on the left and right. But on the left, the guy looks like it's a basketball game. He's going up for a layup. And the one on the right, he's already halfway up shooting. This is exactly what I'm talking about, that subtle uh, three quarters of a second to second and a half time delay that you can get. And this is what your computer does if it doesn't have the processing power to take that real time signal and turn it into your charts and indicators instantly. Now what happens? Let's say you're, you put in a market order to buy oil or to buy a stock. You're, you're basing your decision on a price that might be a second and a half old. So when you get filled, you get executed at a price you totally didn't expect. This is called slippage. Again, slippage is when you get filled at a price you totally didn't expect. And it can be a really frustrating experience. I, you know, I'm sure we've all gone through it one time or another. You click that button. And the price that came back, you were like, huh? Where did that come from? So that is a function of having a computer that just can't handle the real-time data stream. And that's really the trader's biggest misconception when it comes to this hardware, Matt. Yeah, so speaking of that, you know, I think what we would want to do is have you switch over to a live view of your uh, computer, Eddie, and walk us through a demo of how do we know whether the, com the computer we're currently using or a dedicated trading machine will work for trading. How do we know if we're getting into the zones where we could cause slippage or bad executions? Sure. So can you guys see my screen? It's pretty white with a little, little Google emblem. Yeah. yeah, there you go, Google. Awesome. Okay. So uh, I'm going to demo for you exactly how to find out if your computer is fast enough for trading. Now, the most important component of your computer is the processor. The processor is the engine of the computer. So we need to know exactly what processor you have in your machine. And here's how you do that. If you're in Microsoft Windows XP Vista, or seven, you're going to click the start button and you're going to right click computer. In XP, it's my computer. And then you're going to click on the properties at the bottom. And this window is going to come up. Again, XP Vista and seven, start, right click computer or my computer, and then properties. And this window will come up. Now, if in XP, there's one extra step because the window is going to look a little different. There'll be some 
tabs at the top, you want to click on the general tab. Now, if you are using Windows 8, it's a little harder to get to this screen, but here are the directions. And so just kind of try to follow along, or again, um, all of this stuff is in the buyer's guide, which you can get later. If you're using Windows 8, you want to move your cursor to the upper right corner, and a little, the charms menu pops up. It's a, a little menu on the right side of the screen. And then you want to go to the bottom and click settings. Then you want to click PC, change PC settings, which is at the bottom. And then another menu opens up on the left side and you click PC and devices. And then finally you click PC info. Now I know that's long and annoying, honestly. Um, so is Windows 8 in general, which we can talk about a little later. Um, so once you get to this screen, what you want to look for is your processor, which is right here in the middle of the screen. So in my case, I happen to have the Intel Core i7 4790K processor at 3.4 gigahertz, it tells me. OK, so make a note of what processor you have. And while we're on this page, Go ahead and check out how much RAM you have. I happen to have 32 gigs of RAM. And then thirdly, check out what Windows you're operating, you're, you're using. I'm using Windows 7 Pro. So again, you want those three pieces of information, your processor, your RAM, and your operating system. All right, so you guys got that jotted down. Very good. We're going to move to the next step. You're going to go to a website called cpubenchmark.net. cpubenchmark.net. And this is what the site, this, this site looks like. Now, what this site is, is an independent company that's created a software that people from all over the world have downloaded onto their computers and run. And what the software does is actually is a speed test for your processor. But you don't have to run the software because every time someone has run this software, the software automatically sends the results to this giant database that's located right on this site. So you can see what your, pro there's already results for your processor. And we're gonna take a look at that database right now. So where you wanna go, once you get to that site, once you get to this page, See the little drop down over here where it says select a page? Just scroll it down to um, searchable CPU list. Searchable CPU list. And this page will come up. And then down in the middle on the right side, there's a, another search box. I know it's not the most intuitive, but it's down in the middle on the right. And then just start typing your processor. I have the Intel Core i7-4930K. Now look, if I don't put in all of the numbers and letters, there's another processor here. So make sure you put the full number and letter sequence. And then it, once you see yours, sometimes there'll be a list of six or seven of them. Uh, just click on the one you have so it auto-populates in here. And then click Find CPU. So what it's done is it's taken me to the database and it's shown me my benchmark score, something called a benchmark score. In my case, it's 13,200. Now, what does that mean, benchmark score? Well, the higher the number, the faster your computer is. And the minimum benchmark score for trading is, thir uh, I'm sorry, is 7,500, 7,500. So if your benchmark score is less than 7,500, you are potentially at risk for slippage. The lower that number is, the more risk you have. So 7,500 really is the cutoff. Uh, anything below that, again, you put yourself at, at substantial risk. So that's how you find out what processor you have, and that's how you find out how fast that processor is. The second most important uh, item you need to know to have an ultra-fast trading computer is your internet speed. And in my opinion, the single best place to find out your internet speed 
is to go to a website called speedtest.net. Speedtest.net. Let the site load. Don't click on anything. There's a lot of advertising on the site. Once it's fully loaded and it pops up, you'll see this big green pill-shaped button. That's the button you want to press to start the test. So we're going to run this test, and this is going to measure a couple of items of our internet speed. First thing is something called the ping. And the ping is your modem sending a signal to your closest major node, your closest major exchange point, and getting an echo back. And you want to see this ping under 50 milliseconds. The second number that comes up is your download speed. And the minimum download speed for trading is 5 megabits per second. And we're going to put a little uh, checklist up in a second that has these numbers for you. And then finally, you have the upload speed. And the minimum upload speed for trading is 1 megabit per second. So if you, are, if you have a ping that's like 100 milliseconds, you're at risk for slippage. If your download speed is only 1.5 megabits per second, you're at risk for slippage. You need to find a way to upgrade that. Same with your upload speed, at least one megabit per second. So uh, Matt, maybe you can take over the slides and just throw up that checklist. We can talk more about it. Yeah, let's do that now. And you should have the trading computer checklist now. Awesome. So again, CPU benchmark score, you want to be 7,500 or higher. Your ping, less than 50 milliseconds. Your download, greater than 5 megabits per second. Your upload, greater than 1 megabit per second. Now, the next important item is your memory, also called your RAM. RAM is super important. If you're trading with less than 8 gigs these days, you open yourself up to issues, and I'll explain why. As time has gone on, these trading platforms, your Ninja Traders, Trade Stations, um, all the different platforms that are out there have become more robust. They use more RAM. More and more of them are becoming sick, what's called 64-bit, and all that means is they're utilizing more of the computer's resources, and they're using more RAM. So if you run that and you run a trading room, if you're running a trading room that uses Omnovia or GoToWebinar, that is also a big user of resources. Some people have multiple trading applications up and uh, Omnovia up at the same time. All of these things together can quickly bump you up above three, four, five gigs of RAM. So you want to make sure you have enough overhead above that just in case the market gets extremely busy or you have other applications open, because if you use up all your available RAM, your computer, all it knows to do is start using the hard drive for memory, and that essentially will freeze you up. So it's a, it's a risk to you. So at least eight gigs of RAM. Um, and my preferred operating system is Windows 7 64-bit. Now, the 64-bit part, I'll explain briefly. Uh, really, 64-bit, um, from a commercial standpoint, started with Vista and is on all the higher operating systems. And what it does is it unleashes, just without getting too technical, is it unleashes certain bottlenecks that existed beforehand. So if you, would, if you were to think of, like, I grew up in New Jersey, which was um, the toll, toll booth capital of the world back then. And uh, if you can imagine driving down the New Jersey Turnpike or the, the Garden State Parkway years ago, every few miles there were these giant toll booths where they were collecting quarters from people. Um, and you waited for five to sometimes 20 minutes to get through the toll booth. That is what I would call 32-bit, which is like the old days, Windows XP. Now we have, now I live in Florida, there's no more toll booths. There is something called the Sun Pass, which is just uh, a giant transponder I, um, that essentially just reaches the highway 
and sucks dollars right out of my bank account, but I don't have to slow down. So it's, it, it unlocks all those bottlenecks that a toll booth would create. And that's what 64-bit unleash, uh, just unlocks those bottlenecks. And that's why 64-bit is important. It's another reason not to have XP. Now I mentioned seven because the interface is much easier. We all know where the start button is. We all know where the icons are. We all know where Internet Explorer is. We all know how to operate it. Windows 8, Microsoft, in my belief, uh, made a mistake in changing the user interface so dramatically. It works. It's, it's, um, it's very stable. But you have to learn a whole bunch of new commands. And there's a lot of keystrokes and mouse strokes and finger strokes. That's why when I put up those directions for, for Windows 8, just to find the systems page, it, it, it's kind of baffling. It takes that much to get to it. It's kind of why I'm not a fan of it. There's really no big improvement in speed. Um, it was designed to compete with Apple's uh, iPhone operating system and with Android. It wasn't really made for desktop and laptop computers the way we think an operating system should. Very unpopular. Um, if you want it, you know, we, we do sell it if people specifically ask for it, but it's extremely unpopular. And uh, so that is the computer checklist, Matt. And then um, again, do you, I think we want to put up, you know, just where you can get the buyer's guide. Yeah, there you go. So if you go to that page, tradingcomputersnow.com forward slash TP1 and enter your, your email address, we will send you the buyer's guide. There's a ton of great info in there, more than what has been on this webinar um, in, in trader speak. Nothing that's overcomplicated. My, my goal is for you to learn as much as you need so that you have a super stable, super reliable computer and you just have a basic understanding of the important components from a trader's point of view. Things like what backup systems you need uh, as a trader, um, those kinds of things. What types of monitor setups work well. So, so definitely check that out. If you do check that out and you go to that page, we have uh, put together a special deal just for people at, uh, at Traders Pub. So uh, again, it, you will, if you've already gotten the guide, you can go to this page which is, Matt, you want to put the URL in the, uh, in the chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is up there right now for people. Okay. It's forward, tradingcomputersnow.com forward slash TP2-TY. I don't know where we came up with that, but um, that's a special hidden page just for you guys where we put together a special deal for you guys if you're interested, if you feel it's time to upgrade. Um, this particular computer, is, it's called our Apache GT, has a brand new i7 processor that benchmarks at 10,400. So it far hey, exceeds Eddie? the, yeah. One thing, did you want to um, kind of walk people through visually so you can show your desktop again? Um, visually, what specifically? Uh, so if, oh, if you I, wanted I, to walk I people to, through the... Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to grab the screen. I thought mm -hmm. the screen was Just, still on. My there head. you go. Yep. Yep. All right. This is the page. There we go. You guys can see me now. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the page. And uh, we put together a special deal for you guys. It's right here on this page, tradingcomputersnow.com forward slash tp2 dash ty the apache gt again it has the i7 4790 has a benchmark score of 10400 it also has something called a solid state hard drive and so what a solid state hard drive is is think of your iphone or uh if you still if you still use your ipod that's a it has a ton of music stored on it. Even your phone has uh, items that are stored on it. 
And have you ever noticed when you go to retrieve those items on the phone, they come up really quickly? That's because those devices have something called flash memory. There are memory chips in there. Your computer, for the most part, probably 98% of the people in the room, their computers have the old school spinning hard drive, what we know is just a regular hard drive. And, and that drive, that old school drive, is it actually a disk that spins around inside your machine. So the new solid state drives are chips, no moving parts, so they're much more reliable, seven times faster than the standard old school hard drive. Your computer boots up in under 40 seconds. Your trading programs and applications open up nearly instantaneously. So it's really cool, big improvement in your user experience to have a solid state hard drive. Um, this package comes with monitors or without monitors. Uh, we have a five-year warranty on our machines. No one else has that. Lifetime technical support. Our guys, there are people, they build the machines so they know the machines inside and out. Um, not like when you call Dell or HP's technical support and they're not tremendously helpful if you guys have ever had that experience. But you can check out this page um, at your leisure. In a second, we'll open, open it up to questions, but just very briefly, we have some bonuses that come with the machine. Um, we have some special deals with TradeStation and FXCM where they will actually pay you back the cost of the machine in the form of rebates of commissions. So check that out. And uh, Matt, why don't we go ahead and open it up to questions. Yeah, we do have some questions coming in already. I appreciate those guys. And what you can do is just use your general chat box as you, as you have in Omnovia to enter your questions. I will um, sort of moderate and just take as many as I can in the order as I re that I receive them. Sometimes I group them together, don't mind that. But uh, we'll go through as many as you can if you want to enter those now. And we'll just get things started, Eddie, by mentioning that um, Bubba asked earlier, what are your thoughts on using a, a VPS to have an ultra-fast trading computer, or does that help at all? Yeah, excellent question. I get that pretty often. VPS stands for Virtual Private Server, and it is a huge mistake. I will tell you why. Virtual private servers are located in a giant computer warehouse or data center. And all of those resources are shared. They're shared resources. You have to be super careful. If you get dedicated resources in it, uh, which you, you, a lot of times is an option, within six months you could have bought your own super high-end computer with the amount of money they charge for these things. So nearly all of them are shared. So imagine a thousand people potentially sharing the resources of one computer. So a lot of times they try to sell these uh, VPNs based on something called co-location, where the computer is located very close to the exchange's computers with the, with the hope that you're going to get better execution because you're right there next to the exchange's computer. I'm here to tell you that that's just not true and that you're more at risk because of those shared resources than you are uh, of slippage from not being located next to, the, next to the exchange's computer. So be really, really careful. Again, if you're paying for dedicated, dedicated VPN, your resources, if you, if you anything that would match like an i7, you're going to pay like five or six or seven hundred dollars a month for this stuff. So there's really no advantage. And what happens if the server goes out in the middle of the night? They supposedly have a team that, that fixes it. I, you know, I don't know. I've been dealing with web hosts that have similar data centers for a long time. And their, their, their tech support is sketchy at best. I think it's a huge mistake, personally. Good so, um yeah, Juan asks another question we get all the time, which is why does the trading world seem to revolve around PCs versus including Apple computers? Yeah, well, I get that question a lot too. And, and I get it. A lot of people have Apple products. They love their Apple products. It's kind of has a cult following. Um, Steve, Jobs is, Steve Jobs has been made into a legend 
And uh, in this particular case, you can kind of blame Steve Jobs. He, his, his theory was to always be in control of not only all the hardware, but also all, all the software. So he never wanted to lend his, um, his operating system source code to developers. So essentially the trading world shunned him and they did not develop any software for, for Apple computers. Um, in general, even though Apples are pretty cool and slick and the user interface is awesome compared to especially Windows 8, they're underpowered from a hardware perspective relative to, to their PC cousins. They're much more expensive and you get a lot less power for the money in terms of processing power and speed. So there's a number of strikes against us as traders to use apples for trading. Uh, if you want to use it for searching the web and, and fooling around on Facebook, and I think that's fine. Um, you know, I understand. I understand about the, the usability, but uh, that was Steve Jobs. Jobs is doing. So the next question um, I want to ask is from Dan, but I want to preface it. With this, with a just a short story, Eddie, that um, I've sat in many coffee shops while I've been traveling with a laptop with multiple monitors based on what we sell, and I cannot tell you the number of times that people have come over to me and say, "Where did you get that?" So I'm going to ask Dan's question: Can the laptops we sell support two additional travel monitors at one time? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We do have some laptops. Um, that are fast enough for trading. It's a good time to even talk about laptops. Go over here on this laptops page because laptops, 99.9% .9 of the laptops that are uh, on the market now, they, their processor's benchmark score is way below 7,500. All those tablets and ultrabooks, those processors are too slow for trading. So forget trying to trade on them. Um, only the i7-4700 mobile series and higher is fast enough, fast enough to trade with. So please keep that in mind. There's three things that are important for a fast laptop. Number one, having the, this processor or higher. Uh, number two, having a solid state hard drive because the hard drives in most laptops are those old school hard drives and they're slower than the ones that are in desktops. So, uh, and they're also pretty fragile. Solid state drives can take a much more of a laptop beating than a standard old laptop drive. So that's a really big deal. And then the third thing would be having good graphics. So laptops are definitely, um, they're, you can use them for trading now, but you really need a higher end laptop. And uh, there are monitors that travel with laptops now. They're about, um, about 16 inches in, uh, di if you measure them diagonally, they plug into the USB ports. They don't need any additional electricity, so they just take all the power from the USB port. So you could actually have like a three monitor setup. I bet if I have a picture, I have a better, yeah, this isn't the best picture. I have a better picture. But here's the laptop, and here are two monitors. But you could have like, if you think of one laptop with two monitors on either side of it, you could have a three monitor supported laptop in your laptop bag with the extra monitors. So uh, very cool for the, the trader on the go. Okay, and about? then you kind of, yeah, you talked about this already, um, but Pam was just wondering, what, what again, in summary, what did you say about Windows 8 specifically for traders? So Windows 8 works. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's stable. Here are the things most people don't like. Number one, the first version of Windows 8 had no start button, none whatsoever. So it was very hard to find your controls, like where to open a program, where to go to your, your, your hard drives and so forth. You, it was hard to find, and people had to learn a whole bunch of keystrokes. In fact, you have to move the cursor to the corners, it was really made for swiping with your finger on a tablet or uh, a Windows phone. And then the menu would pop up, and it, it's just too many keystrokes. And most 
middle-aged traders like us, just we get kind of stuck in our ways. We like knowing where the commands are. It's almost like if you got in a car and you couldn't put you couldn't find where to put it into drive or the steering wheel was located in a different place. Like all the controls are in the wrong place. And that's why most people don't like it. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It does work. There's no real improvement in speed either. There's no improvement in functionality. There's only uh, a decrease in satisfaction and user experience. So that's, I mean, that's really the summation of Windows 8. Um, it works. I mean, if you like it, that's great. You should use it. But uh, and, and not only that, there are some um, of, if you're using like some custom indicators inside of, say, Ninja Trader, there are a couple of trading platforms that don't really get along with Windows 8 that well just yet. It's improved quite a bit. It's much less of a problem than it was, but it's another thing to think about. So my, my um, operating system of choice is still 7 for the time being. So Johnny and Pete, Johnny and Pete both asked about antivirus software. Uh, what about it? What do you recommend? What do our computers come with? Sure, sure. Good question. Antivirus software has changed a lot in recent years. Uh, years ago, antivirus software would really suck a lot of your resources, like 30% of your computer's resources, while it was always running in the background. That really is no longer the case anymore. So that's not an issue anymore. Um, there are paid for antivirus programs and there are free. And the free ones tend to work just as well as the paid for ones. In fact, I think they're better. Um, for example, Norton, is you pay money for it. And maybe you get it for free from your service provider. But it's just, it has, it's doing too much. It's constantly throwing pop-ups in your face. It's too much of a distraction that you just don't need. Um, there are the free ones called Avast and AVG, and they work very well, but they're also kind of riddled with pop-ups, always trying to upsell you their professional version, which it really isn't any better. Um, they're just trying to upsell you. And then the one we like the most right now is Microsoft security essentials and that's because Microsoft has been so hacked and so attacked they finally came out with a really good product runs quietly in the background you can set it to update itself um, doesn't give you pop-ups annoying pop-ups to up to upgrade and it's free so that's what we're using right now it's what I use myself and it works works great so don't waste your money on you know some fancy um, vi antivirus software. Uh, it is a known fact that the latest version of Avast, which is free, does interfere with TradeStation. And um, some of the paid ones struggle with a lot of the trading platforms. Our experience with Microsoft Security Essentials is it does not conflict with any trading applications. So that's a big deal to consider. Rick wanted to know, what's the biggest monitor that your desktops are capable of? Uh, they're capable of even supporting those 4K resolution screens that just came out. You could buy a giant TV if you wanted to. They, I know uh, I was down at Best Buy the other day, which is not my favorite store, but at least it's one of the few stores you can actually see stuff uh, and touch it. And they had some Samsung 4,000 resolution LED TVs, and they were pretty gorgeous, I must say. And our video cards will support them. So any monitor you can come up with will be supported by, by our machines, any of our machines. Frank was wanting to know if we ship to, to Canada, and I'm sure people have that question about international as well. Sure. So we ship to Canada all the time. It's $99 to ship a computer. For this particular package with the monitors, it's $150 shipping. Um, you will be charged. You will be charged uh, sell Canadian sales tax. And FedEx will hold your system ransom until you pay your Canadian sales tax. That's what FedEx does. And they do that in all countries, by the way. The United States does not charge any 
tariffs to export, but your country might charge a VAT or a sales tax upon import. So make sure you know your country's uh, rules and regulations. If you scroll to the top and this menu on the side, we have a link here, international terms. If you click there, there's more details on international shipping. We, sh we have shipped all over the world, uh, Singapore, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Australia, we ship to all the time. A lot of traders in Australia. Um, the Middle East quite a few times. It's amazing all the places where there are traders around the world. I think it's so cool. Actually, uh, Heinz says that he's in Switzerland and bought um, Easy Trading Computer two years ago and was really happy, had great service. Awesome. Heinz, I think I remember you. Happy to see you. Happy you're enjoying your machine. Don asks, um, is there additional latency issues for traders outside of the U.S.? And also, what are your thoughts on Wi-Fi? Um, so the, I think both questions are, are addressing latency. Or in other words, if when they click buy, the buy button, or buy at the market button, does it take time for that order to get to the exchange to get filled? And I, I do tend to agree that internationally, um, if you're trading U.S. markets, sometimes there can be some issues. Now, um, I think it depends where your broker is located. I think if they have, for, I'm just going to use TradeStation for an example because I know this as a fact. They have a European office. They're supposed to have some rapid fire data centers there in Europe that's, that distribute the, the, the distribute their servers distribute to the exchanges very faster than just if it went over the public internet. So um, it's my belief, I haven't tested this, that if you're, for example, in Europe and you're trading US stocks, TradeStation can be useful to you because they have their own networks to, to send the signals. Um, I was recently in Europe, in France specifically, and um, trying to access U.S. sites, it did seem like there was some latency. So I think it depends on who your data provider is. This is a good question. I don't think we've ever had this one before. So I do, th I do think there's latency, just even from my own personal experience. Um, so I think it depends on your, number one, your, your internet service pro provider, and number two, who's providing your brokerage services. So I would actually put a call into your brokerage service and see when you enter an order, where does it go? How is it routed? Um, the second part of the question is Wi-Fi. And so Wi-Fi from our testing is incrementally slower. So if you're in your home with a wireless router on uh, a computer on the other side of the house that's connected wirelessly from the router, it is incrementally slower. It's not a disaster by any means but it, there, it is an increment slower. And as traders, we want to get rid of all those little increments. So wiring up to the router when possible will benefit you. That's the first thing. The second thing is Wi-Fi in a public location, such as a Starbucks um, or an airport, can be very dangerous, especially regarding identity theft. I would love to think that you know, we can go and trade in an airport and that you're totally, totally safe. But the truth is that if you if you log into say your bank account with a username and password sitting inside the waiting area waiting for your plane, it is highly possible that somebody could grab your keystrokes uh, and grab your username and password. So unless you're on an encrypted network like a home router, very easy to encrypt, um, you're definitely at risk. So keep that in mind. Uh, so you have the, if in a public place you have the speed issue, plus you have the security issue. So two issues combined there. Good question. All right. And then uh, Lisa had asked, what backup power supplies do you recommend? So the best possible backup power supply is to have a in-ground generator that could run for days. Um, no doubt about that. It's the single best thing you can buy, but they're pretty darn expensive. At you know anywhere from ten to twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. 
the average person, the average trader would do very well with something called um, a 2000 volt amp backup battery. A backup battery or UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. Now, it, a lot of these uninterruptible power supply, you'll see, um, I, think, I think the company is called APS. You see a lot of these, APC, I'm sorry. Uh, you see APC is probably the biggest company and they always rate them in the terms of wattage. But wattage really isn't the real story. You want to look for the, what, what's called the VA rating. It's called, it's called, VA stands for volt amps. That number is more important than the wattage. So anything over 800 is decent. And then if you can get up to like 2000, you could run your computer for a solid 15 minutes. You know, most of the time when the power goes out, it flashes on and off for maybe a minute or two or maybe it goes out for two or three minutes. Most of the power outages are like that before they come back up. So what, what, what you wanna do when there is a power outage is simply get out of the market uh, or raise your stops, You know, put your stops in super close to where the market is. So if the power does go out completely, you won't get screwed in the, you know, being blind, not knowing what's going on. I mean. I, for mental stability and keeping your mind in a zen state of mind, getting out of the market is really your best bet in the case of a, a power outage. And then hopefully it comes right back on and there's nothing to worry about. But uh, those, you want at least 800 volt amps, as high as 2000 volt amps on those backup battery supplies. Okay, yeah, and um, we are... Yeah, we was going to say we are closing out here in terms of uh, time, but there was uh, one additional question just about uh, the looks like the Apache and how many video cards are on the Apache that you were showing. This this com particular computer uses Intel video. There's no video cards. This processor can handle three monitors all by itself and all your trading applications. It's once we get to four monitors and more support that we start adding video cards okay and i think uh, many people have noticed the link here in the room on the general chat box that jan has been posting on how to get the guide is there any final thing that you wanted to mention yeah just if you have any questions regarding computers never hesitate to give us a call the 800 number is right here in the in the chat bubble it's also up here on the upper right of every page. Um, if you open this and we're not here for any reason, we're closed and you type a message in here, it will email us directly. We're always happy to answer your questions regarding the technology. Um, and just lastly, our computers come with a five-year warranty. It's not something you see and lifetime tech support. We're here to help you uh, the best we can. And I appreciate everybody taking the time to come out this afternoon. Uh, Raleigh, especially, thank you. And Trading Pub, Yana, thank you so much for having us and putting on such a professional event. Uh, we certainly appreciate that.